Eve. Hello, everybody. I'll just take a drink because why wouldn't I? Hi, I'm Lee from Foodie Book Club and Lee in the Sweet Life. And here we've got the fantastic Tony Rod. Say hello, Tony. Hello, everybody. Oh, Tony's here because I'm a bit of a stalker and um, I just think he's fabulous. And he's our first, first for lunchtime lockdown. So um, tell me what you're making today. So we're going to do um, a take on a risotto, but we're going to make it with quinoa. Um, so slightly different flavours, but also very quick to make um, and something you can almost make in advance. Um, we're going to do it with dried wild mushrooms and some chicken thighs. Oh, now, are you a thigh rather than a breast kind of guy? Because, 100%. yeah, thigh, I don't know why anybody, and I'm sorry to all those people who like the thighs, the breast, but I don't know why anybody serves cooks breasts. I just don't, because juice, flavour is everything's skin on or skin off, bone on or bone off, thighs are the way to go, I think. Yeah, 100% agree. Um, I think for this recipe as well, they're quicker to cook. Yeah. Um, so the whole point of me cooking this for you today was that it's something you can do with ingredients that you probably have around the house, most of them, um, and also with ingredients you can cook really quickly because at lunchtime, I don't want to be messing around for an hour. I want to cook in 10, 20 minutes and then be able to eat. Brilliant. Now your restaurant is called? Uh, it's called Copper and Ink. Uh, we're based in Blackheath. Uh, so Blackheath in South East London. Um, we're currently on lockdown, obviously. We're doing takeaways uh, for the next few weeks. Um, but it's a lovely little uh, village restaurant run by myself and my wife, Becky. Um, we just have a bit of fun with it. Oh, and I'm, I, I was just saying to Lizzie, who's on the other end of all of this thing, doing the technical stuff, that we're going to, are you able to, that we're going to come there when it's open. But, okay, talk us through it um, and tell me why you chose this recipe. Okay, so... Um, first of all, uh, in my house, I've always got a load of dry ingredients because they never go off. And I'm so infrequently at home, able to cook food that when I am at home, I don't want to find that everything's gone off. So um, we're going to be using a few things. We've got dried mushrooms. Um, these mushrooms um, at the moment are porcini mushrooms, but you can use any dried mushrooms. So whatever you've got, little packs of them, hang on to them. They don't go off. Um, and to start off with, I'm basically... Are they expensive, dried mushrooms? No, not particularly. I mean, again, if you were to buy porcini mushrooms um, fresh, uh, A, you've only got them for a couple of months of the year, and B, you're paying through the nose, up to about 30 to 40 pounds a kilo. Uh, they're really expensive. Dried mushrooms, in comparison, are a lot cheaper. You can get them year round and they never go off. And all you've got to do is rehydrate them. So I've got some boiling water. Um, I've popped them in a bowl. Um, and then I've got boiling water here. And that's just going to sit in there and they'll soften down and rehydrate. And already I can smell them. So porcini yeah. mushrooms, very, very meaty. Um, and if you are a, uh, a vegetarian, um, but you recently have converted, this is a really great alternative to meat because it's got that umami flavour. I like the way you said recently converted because that is true, isn't it? Um, having a son who's, who's vegetarian slash vegan, um, it's something about recently converting that makes you still want crave that feeling of meat, that you know chewiness and yeah. Absolutely. So I think these are a really good one. Um, they're also a lot of people think mushrooms are slimy. Porcini mushrooms aren't. The texture of them are quite nice. So again, I'd, I'd recommend porcini, whether they're fresh or dried. They're always good. So that's the first step of this recipe. I'm just leaving those to soak. I'm going to put them to one side. Um, and then we'll come back to those later. Now, um, I've replaced risotto rice uh, with quinoa. Um, and I've got two types of quinoa here. I've got red and uh, white quinoa. You can use black as well, it's fine. The reason I've done that, first of all, um, it's quite nutty in flavor, which I think is really lovely. Um, and secondly, um, it's quick to cook. It's gonna take us about 15 minutes to cook. But also you can do this recipe with pre-cooked quinoa. So if you've got quinoa that's cooked you right. eat for a, a dish, and then you've got some left over, hang on to it, I'm gonna use it again. Um, I've got here some veg stock, you can use a veg stock cube. The reason I'm doing that, again, in the restaurant, um, I would inevitably make my own veg stock. I'd, um, I'd roast down some vegetables, um, I'd then have some, uh, some water and I'd uh, cook them down on the stove and get all that beautiful flavor. Um, and I'd use that. Um, but in reality at home, no one wants to do that. So a veg stock in here, Gives you loads of flavour. Same if you're cooking pasta. Don't just cook pasta in plain water or even just salted water. Veg stock or chicken stock if you eat meat, perfect. Um, flavour every stage of the way, isn't it? That's what I think. Every stage. Absolutely. I'm not talking salt, I'm talking flavour. Flavour, exactly yeah. that. We'll talk about that a little bit more um, in a little while as well. So in this pan, I'm going to turn it on to full. Um, we use induction here at the restaurant. It's nice and quick. The downside is you might get a little bit of fan noise in the background. Um, but in this pan, all I've got is the mixture of white and red quinoa, uh, the veg stock, um, and some uh, hot water. 
I'm going to give it a good stir. I want to get that veg stock cube sort of broken up um, so it uh, isn't just a one lump. Um, I've got about as twice as much water as I have quinoa. Okay. Um, the quinoa will uh, evaporate um, a lot of that water off and then soak some of it up. And I'm going to bring it up to the boil. And then once that's come up to the boil, um, I'm going to take it down to the lowest temperature I can get it to. Okay. And I'm going to cover it with a lid and I'm just going to leave it. And I'm going to leave it for a, about 15 minutes. You can do slightly less al dente. We're also going to then cook it a little bit later with some of these other ingredients. All right. Or you can cook it like slightly more, and it'll be softer. Um, but 15 minutes is all you need. And like I say, this recipe can be done with pre-cooked quinoa that's in your fridge. You can get these packets, can't you, of pre-cooked yeah. quinoa. And I know there's a there's a lovely shop that I go to with a capital A and N and D, which has the um, both of those colours in one packet, because I buy yeah. it, it's less than a pound. So it's really, really reasonable. And it's really simple to do. Yeah. Now we're already up to the boil, the beauty, beauty of induction. Um, so I'm just going to pull that off because this will boil over for now. I've put a lid on it. Uh -huh. I'm just going to leave that for the time being just to sit in its own heat. I will click it onto the lowest heat in a second. In fact, I'm going to put it on the stove behind me. Okay. Because uh, I've got more control on that one. Um, and that's it. 15 minutes later, that quinoa is going to be absolutely perfect. We don't need to worry about anything else with it until then, which is great. Um, in the meantime, we can get on and do a few other jobs uh, for this dish. Now, I like to try and use a few. Maybe get your coffee out there, and I was just gonna. Ah, uh, my coffee's up there. I have to move on to something else in a minute. I've got a plan. For that. Don't worry. Yay. <laughs> so I've got the Nutribullet out. Um, you can do this with a, a Nutribullet if anyone's got one, but you could also do it with um, a blender or anything like that. So I like to use a couple of ingredients in as many ways as I can when I do recipes just to get as much flavor from them as is possible. Um, so I'm using my wild mushrooms in another way. So I've got these dried uh, porcini mushrooms. I'm gonna pop them in my Nutribullet, get rid of my bowl, there we go. Um, I'm gonna put the lid on um, and I'm going to blitz this up. And all this is gonna do is it's gonna make us a porcini powder. Oh yes. Um, um, leave that away. That's so I can just do that. That is done. Sherbet, yeah. teeny sherbet. Absolutely, essentially that's what we've got. Um, now this then becomes a really lovely seasoning for whatever we want to do later on. So whether or not it's just sprinkling it on the top of the dish or whether it's adding that umami flavor that I talked about earlier, um, we can do whatever. And I'm gonna use it on our chicken thighs. That's such a good tip. That is a it's such a good tip to, to have. Like, could you store that in a little pot in your, in your pantry? Yeah. It's still dried, you've not added anything to this, so this yeah. is going to be in your pantry for, for six months, a year. As long as it's airproof, you're fine. Um, if you haven't got a blender, if you haven't got a Nutribullet, you've got a pestle and mortar, add some coarse salt, yeah. so rock salt or molten sea salt, something like that to it, and then grind it up. But just remember that you've put salt in there because then later on when you season anything with it, you don't want to add more salt to it. Okay. Nice and easy. Love it. Um, so I'm going to um, start cooking other elements of this dish because essentially I've got to wait about 15 minutes for the quinoa to get up to temperature and to cook through. So I might as well crack on with other jobs because essentially I'm greedy <laughs> eat as quickly as I can. So I've got another pan on the stove here. I'm gonna add some plain oil, rapeseed oil this is. You can mm -hmm. use rapeseed oil, vegetable oil, uh, sunflower oil. You can use olive oil. But obviously, again, I tend not to. A, it's expensive, save yep. your money. Uh, B, if you get it too hot, it can burn um, and it can, it can uh, get to the point where it's not good for you as well. Um, I'm going to put that on a medium heat. Um, and we talked about flavor earlier. I've got a tray here with some other ingredients. Uh, I've got rosemary. Yep. Um, that's going in the pan. Yep. I've got garlic, just yep. close with garlic. You can do it with the skin on as well. It's absolutely fine. Um, and I've got some thyme. Um, I'm going to pop in that into the pan as it is. Um, and what that's going to do is the flavors from those herbs and the garlic are going to start to come out into my oil and flavor the oil. If ever I'm cooking meat or fish, I want to just make sure that there's as much flavor on that as I can. So the oil has got extra things put in it. You can make compound oils by steeping all of these lovely flavors into it and then just having a bottle of it on the side. Or you can do it like this. This is absolutely fine. What I was going to say was, people think that it's really difficult to get flavour into stuff, but you don't even have to pick off all the leaves and things like that. You just do it. Just yeah. what's the worst that can happen? 
Exactly that. And it doesn't matter what you've got. You know, any herbs can go in there. Hard herbs are best. So by hard herbs, what I mean is rosemaries and thymes and things like that, sages, rather than soft herbs, leafy things like parsley's and uh, corianders. But they'll go in there. And at the end of it, all you do is you just chuck that in the bin and you're done. But if I'm cooking lots of things in this pan, once the uh, chickens come out, I'll then start to like, put other things in there to just add more flavour and build up flavour in there. So it's the way to go. I'm adding a little bit of um, uh, oil to my chicken skin. Mm -hmm. I'm going to season it. Now I've got two salts on the go. I've got a fine salt, which is what I tend to use for uh, seasoning things that I'm cooking. Um, essentially, it's cheaper. Um, and because it's fine, it coats things better. And then I've got a molden salt or a rock salt, uh, sea salt. And that's what I call finishing salt. So once something's cooked, I sprinkle that on. It's got a better flavour. It's more expensive, so I don't want to use it all the way through. But also that texture comes through at the end and it can be nice and crunchy. So I use two different salts. I'm then going to use this porcini powder and I'm going to sprinkle that onto the skin of my chicken as well. Incredible. And that's going to give me more of that umami flavor and mushroom flavor through me. Okay. These are already dribbling, which is I good. Am. I'm going to be good and use tongs. Normally I'd obviously use with my hands, but then afterwards I'd be washing my hands the whole time. But we've got a limited amount of time here and uh, one camera. You yeah. don't want to watch me washing my hands every five minutes. <laughs> Uh, there we go. Um, now, my oil is obviously getting up to temperature. My herbs are starting to pop and crack and sort of bubble away, which is great. So all I'm going to do is, once that flavour is starting to come out of the herbs and the garlic, I'm going to pop my chicken skin side down to start with oh, in nice. the pan. And again, like I said, I've got it on about a medium heat, medium high heat. I don't want to go too hard with this because A, the powder of the mushrooms will, will start to burn, but also the skin could burn. What I want to do is I want to start getting that skin nice and crispy, yeah. but gently. I want to take right. my Okay. Now I've got the flesh side up on the chicken. So while the flesh side's up, we make sure we season that as well. Again, a little bit of fine salt. Um, and I'm going to put a little bit of that mushroom powder on there as well, but only a little bit on the uh, skin, uh, on the flesh side. Um, and that's it. And that is quite literally all I need to do with that chicken right now. Now, I'm going to cook this chicken through in the pan. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do it about four or five minutes on the uh, flesh side, uh, on the skin side. And then I'm going to do it a couple of minutes on the flesh side until it's cooked. If you're not confident with that, when it's come out of the pan, pop it in the oven, about 180 degrees, four or five minutes, depending on how thick your thighs are. These are off the bone. So essentially they're only a, a centimetre thick. They're not going to take long to cook. If somebody doesn't want chicken, and we've talked about mushrooms, what about uh, 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 another substitute, fishy type thing? Yeah, so you could easily do this with, instead of chicken, if you wanted to use another meat, pork belly, but bear in mind it's going to take you longer. Yeah. Um, if you wanted to do it with fish, you could absolutely do it with any white fish. Um, things like uh, sea bream and sea bass work yeah. really lovely with wild mushrooms. Um, don't ask me why. Normally things that grow together go together. So wild mushrooms obviously come often from the woods. You'd expect them to go with woodland or tumble flavours, but they work quite well. Someone's at the front door. <laughs> Hello, front door. That'll be a delivery of something, but they can wait. Um, <laughs> it's live! Yeah, you know what it's like. Um, <laughs> but equally so, if you wanted to go purely vegetarian, something like a king oyster mushroom works beautifully well. So they're yeah. really meaty and firm. Um, you can cook them in the same way as the chicken, in a pan with garlic and herbs, um, and they'll be a lovely texture, a lovely flavour, definitely the way to go. So that's if you I've... had three ingredients, okay, what are your three ingredients, well, um, Tony, to, to use and to eat? Um, How does it work? So mushrooms, I would say 100%. I love eating them, um, but I love cooking with them. They're so versatile, they're so varied in terms of the flavours and the varieties. Yeah. Um, and they can serve a number of purposes. Um, I would say I'm just checking my skin to make sure that we're not burning, we're still golden, which we are, which is good. Um, I would say peanut butter. Again, peanut butter is great because it's got that kind of sweet but also salty. Yes. And it works in desserts but also in savoury. So peanut butter for me is one of those oh, glorious yeah. things. I just love it. Yeah. Um, and then I'd probably say herbs. Um, no. just, I know it's, it's broad and it's wide, but I use herbs in everything. And I use a lot of dried herbs as well as fresh herbs because, same as all of this, 
It's always available to me. I've got them in the kitchen all the time. Um, they're cheap, um, but they impart so much flavour. So you can knock up a really quick something on the stove, chuck in some dry herbs, and it just elevates it to another level. So when you're cooking at home, okay, yeah. what was your go-to dried herbs? Because like you, uh, like you said, we've all got these herbs that are. So actually, Absolutely. I went to my pantry a little while ago, and so one of my herbs was like two years old. That was at the back of the. Probably not good to eat, is it really? But. So I would say for me, my go-to is probably thyme. Uh, yeah. Dried thyme, I love. Um, and I use it sweet and savoury as well, which is great. Um, spices, uh, fresh um, and dried uh, paprika. Uh, not the smoked stuff, the, the plain stuff. I love it. I use it in everything, quite literally everything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, our spices and herbs cupboard is pretty expensive. Yeah, I'm laughing because I use paprika and everything and who Lizzie who puts my stuff on the website was laughing because she knows everything's got paprika, paprika yeah. this, paprika. It's because it's just so versatile and underrated, I think, isn't it? Okay. okay so, um, I've flipped my chicken. Um, yeah. I've put the herbs on top. Essentially, the herbs have already started to flavour this beautiful oil. But what they're now doing is they're sitting on top of the chicken. So any of the oils from the herbs themselves will just continue to drip into the meat themselves. And that will be great. If I was going to put this in the oven. Yeah. I probably put it on top of the herbs with a few of them on top as well, just so again the herbs are kind of sandwiching it while it's in the oven and it continues to flavour. Herb up. sandwich, herb sandwich. Yeah, herb sandwich, why not? <laughs> um, this is going to just sit here now. Um, we've got the, uh, the flesh side, it's not going to take long to cook on that yep. side. Um, and I'm probably going to flip it just one more time onto the skin, just to make sure my skin's nice and crispy. And then I'm going to take it up and I'm going to rest it on the board. Now, I always rest my meat, whatever it is, for about five minutes for every half an hour it's cooked, give or take. Now, it's great resting, Tony, because people at home will, um, you know, and I sometimes, if I'm really that hungry, which is quite often, will do a roast, do whatever, and then they'll take it out of the oven or chicken and cut it and serve it. Why rest it? Because people think, oh, that's a chefy thing to do, but it's really important, isn't it? Yeah, it, it will definitely do two things to your food. It will first of all make the food uh, more tender. Yep. Um, imagine if you were to go out into either the really cold or something really, really hot. You tense up. And essentially, the meat will tense up while it's cooking. Um, and this goes for fishes as well as meat. When you rest it, the meat has a chance to just to relax. All those um, fibres in the meat just start to relax and they yeah. um, soften down. And in doing so, the meat becomes a lot more tender than when you go to eat it later on. Secondly, let's put those out and leave them there. Because they're starting to relax, I'm just moving my pan. As they're relaxing, any of the juices that are in your meat, they're going to start to allow to go back into those fibres. Um, so instead of all the juices just cutting into it and dribbling everywhere, they get absorbed back into the meat and the meat will be juicy and tender, which is great. Same with fish. So if you cook fish, let it rest, not quite as long. It will keep its own heat. And if you are worried, if you haven't got crispy skin, cover with a bit of foil and then stick a tea towel on top and that'll keep the heat in. If you've got crispy skin, you do that, you won't have crispy skin anymore. If, that's what people worry about, isn't it? That it's going to get cold or, you know. Yeah. It's... It'll be fine. It'll be absolutely fine. Fine. Uh, you're fine. The other thing that I would say is, if you're cooking meat in liquid, so you're doing a stew or a braise or something like that, and you want to take it out of the liquid, um, to pull apart or do something like that, allow it to cool down in the liquid and before you do that. Because that, again, otherwise what happens is you take it out and it immediately dries out because all of the steam of the meat as it's cooling down is essentially all of the juices coming out of it and it just dries out because all of those beautiful juices are just in the air. Because there's this thing cool. that, where people think, oh, I've, I've put my stuff in the slow cooker and I took it out. It's been in there for hours. It should be nice and soft and juicy. And then it isn't. And they go, why isn't it? Yeah. And that's exactly that. Now, my quinoa, um, it should now be cooked. So I'm going to test it. I'll find something on my lid. There we go. Um, so I'm just going to give it a test. Now, this is one of the key things that I say to everybody when they're cooking at home or anywhere else. Always taste your food. See what it tastes like. Is it too salty, not salty enough? Is it cooked through? Blow it because it's going to be hot. Fine. So this is what I would call mm, al dente. Um, it's still got a little bit of bite to it, but that's yeah. fine because we're going to continue to cook this. So I've got another pan. Uh -huh. um, white truffle oil. Again, Ooh. truffle this oil. Is, bit, isn't it? This is oh, the it's great. 
And it's so much cheaper than Ew. fresh truffles because you never see me using fresh truffles in our like, truffle as well. We'll get to that later, it's fine. <laughs> so truffle oil is a great way of, again, chucking more flavor into it. And truffles and mushrooms are part of the same family. So why wouldn't you use them? So great. Um, truffle oil in a pan. If you don't like truffles or you haven't got any truffle oil, just some oil, some plain oil is fine. Again, use the cheap stuff, it's fine. Um, I'm gonna go some of my quinoa is gonna go into this pan as well. Mm -hmm. Now, again, if you don't like quinoa, you can use rice. You can use risotto rice, but it will take you longer. Yep. But this will work. Now, if your quinoa is already cooked, just chuck it in at this stage. You don't have to worry about cooking it first. No. It goes into the pan with your oil and you're already there. Um, again, we spoke earlier um, offline, off the cameras, about the fact that everything in our restaurant is gluten free. Um, my wife, Becky, is gluten intolerant. Um, our head chef, Rob, his brother is a celiac. Um, as a result, we made sure everything in the restaurant is edible for everybody. Why not? Why wouldn't you do yeah, that? Absolutely. Um, and again, quinoa is one of those things, if anyone's not sure, it's a grain that is no gluten in it, so it's absolutely fine. Um, and a nice way of getting both protein um, and starch uh, into your food as well. And it's like I said, it's got a nice nutty flavor. Now I'm heating this up. I've got it again on a low to medium heat. We don't need to go too hard with this, which is good. And then I've got some, uh, I've got a 30 month old Parmesan from Neil's Yard. Um, however, it's really good as well. Um, however, again, this will contain animal rennet. Um, hard cheeses often do. So if you are a vegetarian and you're not gonna have the chicken, just make sure you use something like a Grana Padana, which again, doesn't necessarily have that animal rennet, if you care. Okay. That in. As much or as little of this as you want. Again, this is going to give us a saltiness and an umami, um, which is absolutely gorgeous. And it's going to start to bind this risotto together. Next up, I've got creme fraiche. Um, again, I love the fact that this has got a slight lactic acidity to it. Um, it's just going to cut through some of the richness. And again, it's that creaminess that I love in a risotto. I don't like dry risottos. I want risottos that are slightly wet. Um, I want something that's unctuous. So if that's I, if in. I open my fridge door and I didn't have that, and I had oh. some plain Greek yogurt or... Yeah, perfect. Greek yogurt's fine. Sour cream's fine. Yeah. Um, or don't worry about it. Just have it without. You know, the, the butter and the parmesan and everything else that we're going to use will be absolutely fine in this. Um, now, I've added quite a lot, so as a result, I've got a really wet uh, risotto. Don't worry about it. I'm just turning up the heat. I'm going to cook it down a little bit. That's absolutely Don't fine. Don't worry about it. It'll turn out. And that is exactly my attitude with everything to do with cooking, and it's what I always tell people. If something goes wrong, don't panic. Don't panic. You've always got Deliveroo. Um, <laughs> however, if you are able to get it right, then just take your time, use your instinct, think about what you can do to change it and fix it. If the meat's not cooked enough, when I cut into this, I'm just gonna pop it in the oven. If it's slightly overcooked, I'm just gonna pretend that it's fine and that's how I wanted it. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's all we do is we just try and work instinctively um, and instincts are great when you're cooking. If you put something in the oven and the recipe says, put it in the oven for half an hour and after 20 minutes, your eyes are streaming because there's smoke coming out your oven, Take it out of the oven, probably done. <laughs> Likewise, if you take it out of the oven and you don't think it's cooked yet, put it back in. Yeah. And use your instincts, use your nose for the sense of smell. You can hear things when they're cooking. And then obviously, again, if your eyes are streaming, you've got <laughs> It isn't that the same as like, you know, we talk, you talk about flavour and salt, the different kinds of salt. I mean, yep. I, I'm not a salt person. I love mould and salt, and that's the thing that goes in. Um, but during the, the whole process of, of cooking it, I would put as little salt in as possible. Because yeah, fine. That's fine, but other people like whacking it in. Mm. And everybody's, um, everyone's different. Yeah. They do it their own way, and that's perfectly fine. So why wouldn't you do that? Exactly. Right, I've got some dried mushrooms here that are now beautifully juicy because yeah. they've been steeped in that um, lovely mushroom, uh, in that uh, boiling water. Um, now again, what you can do is you can use that liquid to cook your risotto if you want to, because it's got that mushroom flavor. No I'll way. This. I'll make a nice uh, mushroom soup out of that later. A waste, like okay. that. Um, so now all I'm doing is I'm just chucking some of those mushrooms into my risotto, just so they cook through um, and get nice and hot. But essentially, they're good to go. Um, this is also now adding more flavor to the risotto. So, I mean, I'm already looking forward to this. 
Okay. Now, take it from here, and I'm not. I wish I'm. I'd, I, wouldn't it be good if we were there doing this all live? I'd be. I'd be having my, my head in that pot right now. Sorry, Lee. Uh, no. I've got a plate. Um, this is how simple and quick this recipe is going to be. You know, essentially, um, we are done. Um, the risotto is cooked again. If you were doing this with a normal risotto, uh, arboro rice or something like that, you're going to end up being there for about twenty minutes to half an hour. Um, and you're going to be stirring constantly. This, 15 minutes, and then yeah. you're done. I mean, this is perfect. I mean, when this happens, when people unexpectedly turn up for lunch, you know, as one day it will happen, this is something I can just literally open the cupboard and go, that's, yeah. you know, I've, I've got, got stuff that I can use. Yeah, exactly that. And yeah. again, just change out the flavours with yeah. whatever you've got. I've added a couple of cubes of butter because huh? you can, why not? <laughs> um, it helps thicken uh, the risotto. It also helps add a little bit of flavour. I use unsalted butter um, yeah. because then I can add salt later if I want to. Um, it doesn't impart that on it. Perfect. Oh. Don't have any more on that. Um, oh. And I'm going straight into my bowl. Oh. Again, I want this quite loose. I don't want it too dry. This is going to act as a sauce as well as you know the is starch. It, is it true, Tony, that risotto yeah. should do this? I think so, personally. But I think you, you eat how you want to eat. Yeah. Um, I think you, know, you don't feel that you have to eat the way an Italian tells you to eat. Um, right wine. White wine would do. Their way is always better, apparently, but hey. Um, I've got my chicken. I'm just going to slice my chicken. Moment of truth. Yeah. It's cooked. Cut. Of course it's cooked. Of course it um, is. Again, you don't need to slice the chicken. You could just stick the whole um, sort of thigh on top. But yeah. for me, this lunch wants to be something that you can eat with just a fork, yeah. uh, chatting to your girlfriends, um, not worrying too much about the fact that you've got this food in front of you that needs you to be sitting uh, on ceremony with a knife and fork. Yeah, it's and not my thing. When you say that, chatting with your girlfriend, this is actually a really good thing to have with your girlfriends on a Friday night on Zoom. Somebody's cooking it. Everybody's cooking it in the kitchen and then sure. down to eat it. It's so, such a crazy good thing. Why not? Um, yeah. Truffle. Again, if you can get hold of truffle, I mean, why not? I've got this because I've got it in the kitchen at the moment. So I'm going to add some truffle to the um, the dish because I just love truffle. Um, this is the joys of being a chef. Um, you get to use amazing ingredients. And when they're not finished at the restaurant um, and you've got to the end of the week, you just take them home and put them on your breakfast. Such a shame, um, isn't it? Truffle in your eggs. It's awful. We call it um, chef's perks. <laughs> And then I've got some nasturtium leaves. Again, you could put some chopped herbs on top of this, but nasturtium for me are great. They grow in my garden. Um, I bought these. Um, they grow in my garden. Um, <coughs> and the beauty is they've got a real pepperiness. Yeah. Um, so they work quite, work quite well with that. Now, uh, the top down camera, hopefully you can see that. I'll yeah. raise it a little bit. Amazing. Absolutely uh, amazing. Really, really good. For you guys there, that's that. Yeah. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this as well. If you are serving this to friends, yes. a really lovely Chardonnay works beautifully. Um, this is a Californian Chardonnay. Um, it's got uh, old oak, which wow. means essentially it's not going to be really oaky. So everybody that says to you, I don't really like Chardonnay, what they mean is I don't really like oaked wines most right. of the time, because I guarantee they probably drink Prosecco and Champagne and lots of other wines that have Chardonnay in. Chardonnay is just a great variety. If you don't like really oaky flavours, go for something with old oak. It doesn't take on as much flavour from the barrel. So um, this is a Nielsen Chardonnay uh, from California. Um, it's got old oak, so it's not too woody, um, but it will work really, really well with the wild mushrooms and the chicken and then the creamy flavours in this. Um, and I think that's bloody lovely. Oh, do you know what? I just want to say thank you. I've got some fun questions, right? Which, okay. Okay, so you eat. You just eat and tell me what. Okay, so one purchase. I'm, just, I'm dribbling here. One purchase that a home cook should put on their Christmas list. Um, a thermometer. So you've got two types of thermometer. You've got a, a probe thermometer like that, yep. um, which I use in the kitchen quite a lot when I'm just testing a bit of meat to make sure it's cooked. Okay. Alternatively, a cake tester, which you can poke into the middle of a bit of fish or a bit of meat, especially fish because a, a thermometer is a bit. Um, intrusive leave it in there for 30 seconds touch it on your lip or on the uh, wrist of your hand if yeah. it's hot the middle's hot great but the thermometer you should get for home is one of these 
It's got a wire on it, it's got a probe and it's got this. Normally a magnetic one. You can pop that into your joint of meat in the oven. This stays on the outside and it tells you what temperature your meat's at while it's cooking. If you're doing a Christmas turkey, your turkey will be cooked perfectly on the legs and it won't be too dry on the thighs. And this will beep at you when it's at the temperature you tell it to be. So you get it out of the oven, as opposed to saying it's an hour and a half, getting it out, putting the thermometer in it and it's gone over and you've got a well done. So get a really good probe. And they're like 12 quid or something like that. Perfect. Get really, these are great. That's perfect. Okay, another question. Give me one top tip for a home cook. Top tip for a home cook. Um, I said it earlier, first of all, like use your senses, smell, touch, uh, hearing, sight, everything, use your senses um, and trust those instincts because if you don't, something will go wrong. Um, and secondly, don't worry, cooking shouldn't be stressful. It should be fun. Um, so if you're having fun, that's the main thing. It's just food. It's nothing more serious than just food. Yeah. Um, and then the last one, which I had a minute ago and I've already lost. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Um, I'll ask another question because I've still got a couple to go. Because, okay, food fad. This is my favourite question. Food fad that you're glad is gone for good. Just like the 80s fashion, with a, which actually is coming back, isn't it? Um, okay, I don't follow food fads at all. Um, I'm embarrassed to say as a chef and a restaurant. <laughs> but what I do know, um, it was a fad that I'm glad that went decades ago is having anything cooked in aspic or in jelly. Oh God, yeah. Like a long time ago, before most of yeah. the audience will know, um, a lot of things were cooked and set in gelatin. And like, why Why would you do that? So that, I mean, that's probably the food fad I'm most glad has gone. Okay. Well, do you know what? I, I'm hoping that um, slates and boards will go. Oh God, yeah. Give us plates. We want plates. I give me a plate, please. I don't want to have to, anyway. This is my favorite question and it's very personal. Oh. Okay. Do you have a favorite uh, knife? Uh, yeah, I do. So um, the knife I was just using yeah. um, is my chef's knife. Um, so chef's knife is the shape. Um, so it's normally long, slightly rounded, um, of a decent enough length that you can do most jobs with. Right. Um, this is a, a Kai Shun, I think is the brand, it's Japanese. So um, Japanese knives tend to be lighter, uh, thinner, um, harder and sharper than European counterparts. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean they're better, yeah. it's what's right for you. Okay. Um, but working in a professional kitchen where I use a knife um, for 15, plus hours a day, having a knife that isn't heavy means that I can use it without getting tired. Uh -huh. um, and that is hard, that's the steel is hard, means it stays sharp for longer, so I'm not constantly sharpening. Um, does it get old? Uh, does it, so knives don't really get old, but knives do get blunt. Uh -huh. um, so you've got two ways of sharpening a knife. You can sharpen it on a steel, um, which you'll see chefs doing. Uh, mine's uh, over here in my knife roll. Um, or you can do it on a sharpening stone, um, which often um, more professional chefs rather than home chefs will do. Um, they're harder to do, um, but you get the, a better edge on it. Um, better? I think so personally, yes. I tend to sharpen this on a stone um, less frequently, gets it really sharp, and then when I need to just give it a quick lick on a steel, I do. Um, you can get someone to come over to your house. If you live in London, I highly recommend londonknifesharpening.com. Um, a guy called Daniel, he comes to your house with a little bit and just plugs it in, sharpens your knives and off he goes. Um, he doesn't do my Japanese steel though. These have got a very specific angle on the edge that I like to look after. But um, the Japanese knife company in Soho, you could send your knives to them and they will do them on a wheel and they'll make sure they're perfect. But I think knives don't get old. You've just got to look after them um, and get a knife that works for you. And the main thing is the handle. If it's comfortable in your hand, and the size feels appropriate for you, that's fine. Wow. If the knife's too big or too small or not comfortable in the, in the handle, then get a different knife. Um, and if you're buying knives for home, one chef's knife is yep. probably all you need. Okay. If you're butchering meat um, and you're doing things like that, a small boning knife, thin tip, quite short and pointy. Okay. If you're filleting fish, a knife that's got a lot of bend on it, um, that helps you fillet fish. Again, quite a thin blade. And if you're carving meat, go off camera, sorry, Lee. Yeah. A long and slightly um, thin uh, blade this way, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, good for carving meat. You can get long strokes. And because it's not a deep blade, it doesn't rub up against the meat as you're carving. And then obviously a bread knife, but you don't need, when you go and buy these kits that have got hundreds of knives, you don't need more. If you're <laughs> huge, big, and you know, the electric knives, let's just throw those away, please. Yeah. Um, I've still got one, but I <laughs> use the carving foam for Halloween. Have you got a sandwich maker in the cupboard as well? Yeah, and yeah. a waffle maker. Everything. Do you know what? Thank you ever so much. You've made quinoa risotto, wild mushroom with chicken thigh, which is awesome. Just show us it again. Uh, that camera. Yeah. And for you guys there. God, it's so brilliant. I'm taking this home to Becky with the wine and we're going to eat this. Oh, someday. yeah. Tell us all about your company. How can we reach you? How can people follow you? What can they, can they ask you questions? Anything? Um, so the restaurant is called Copper and Ink. Um, it's copperandink.com uh, is the website. Um, we're in Blackheath, South East London. Um, and we're normally open, but at the moment, takeaways only. Um, if you want to follow me on social media, um, if you Google Tony uh, Rog, R O D D, you'll find me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, same as the restaurant, um, where we post all of the, uh, the food that we create, um, what's going on at the restaurant. Um, and my gorgeous wife, uh, Becky, who is Pin Up Pantry GF, because she's gluten free, um, who I believe is coming on to do some cooking with you too. Yeah. Week after next, I'm so, and I know Lizzie is because she's a gluten free. She's probably going to be asking all the questions. I'm so excited. And there's going to be, hopefully, fingers crossed, a recipe book coming out in the next month. Yes, yeah, soon, soon. So we've got a recipe book with all the recipes from uh, the restaurant over the last couple of years and the story of us opening the restaurant and all of the, uh, the difficulties of owning a restaurant and, and operating. Especially now. Okay. Thank you so much, Tony. I love you to bit. Speak to you very soon. And bye, guys. Remember, Foodie Book Club, please start your own book club and help us support food, help us support independent businesses, and help us support all the emotional well being of everybody. So, bye. Hope